Good day, everyone, and welcome back from your break. My name is Carolyn Chisata. I'm an associate professor and a development economist at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. And I'm also visiting the uh, University of Oxford as an AFOX fellow. So I'll be moderating this session on working with social determinants in maternal mental health. Not only are we contending with biological factors that can contribute to this uh, mental health, but also the social and economic conditions related to the, to the environment that uh, most women are exposed to, such as poverty, financial strain, lack of housing, domestic violence at home, lack of family support, employment status of the women matters, forced migration due to conflicts, food insecurity due to climate change, and certain cultural stigmas and norms. These and more can be factors that play a role in um, um, maternal mental health. And as a development um, economist, these issues intersect with my research related to human capital and development, um, which speaks to people's welfare. Uh, because mental health is actually a serious um, concern uh, for economic development as it affects the productivity uh, of, uh, of the people. And women tend to be um, I'm not saying this just because I'm a woman, but we tend to be quite productive. So, so you need to have your women <laughs> emotionally and mentally uh, in, a, in a good space, right? So without um, today, my, my panelists today um, include experts on maternal mental health, and they are here to provide us with more context on some of these social determinants and possible interventions as well to alleviate the strain on women's well-being. So without wasting any more time, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Ms. Car uh, Caroline Wainana. She is a public health researcher at the African Population and Health Research Center, and she's currently a PhD fellow at the University Medical Center in uh, Utrecht, um, Netherlands. With over 10 years of work experience, she has worked with various populations, including middle income, urban, urban poor, rural, and migrant pastoralist communities. She is a maternal health champion, seeking to make a difference in women's lives and passionate to see women not only survive, but, but thrive. So Caroline will be talking or taking us through um, her research on women's empowerment and maternal mental stress. It's an exploratory study in rural Kenya. Thank you, Caroline. Hello. All right. Um, so apart from all that introduction, I'm also a mother of three two adolescents and one and one young boy and so this is also very passionate um, area for me as an individual and therefore I'm going to go through um, is it Just advancing the slides. There we go. All right. And so um, I'll talk about the project that we did in rural Kenya and uh, just a, a, a brief about it and then what challenges we encountered and some of the lessons that we learned. And uh, the project, um, as I said, was in rural Kenya, and we did it as a quantitative approach. And I'm going to use one of the approaches that we did, which was ethnography, where we observed 20 women twice a month for four months. And so whatever I'm presenting is around that population. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the focus group discussion. The study setting was in Western Kenya, where you can see it's written Kakamega. That's where we conducted our study. 
And uh, the link, what you were looking at was, what, um, I mean, what's the link between women empowerment, digital financial services, and maternal mental health. And so that was our driving objective. And one of the key things that we realized in this community, in this community was CHAMA, which is savings, community savings groups, was actually a lifeline for women in terms of economic empowerment, but also in terms of social support. So that was the link we saw, and it actually led to them dealing with a lot of life stresses that they were going through. One quote talks about a woman who actually saved through the work that she did. And it was because she knew what her responsibilities were, and she knew the kind of support that she could get from the husband. And so these were some of the things that were coming out during our uh, observation, which was now um, actually covert observation, where they knew we were observing them. Then we talk about Caroline. I think there's a problem with this mic causing an echo online. So if we could just do without the mic, this should be picking you up. Okay. Uh, All right. So I'll, I'll try and speak a bit louder. So we look now at the what is the story around the project that we did. There was this woman. Her situation was she was being beaten by, by her husband, who was an alcoholic and did not work. And for her, what she did, she decided to start up a business. And you look at what the mother, I mean, what, um, uh, what she talks about in terms of her marital situation and what she says, even the, ma the, the mother-in-law told her, which already indicates one of the determinants, the lack of social support. This is another story of somebody else who talks about, you know, and this is the mother-in-law saying to the respondent who was now the field interviewers we had, that the woman is not around. Your participant is not around. And she keeps leaving all the time because of the marital issues that they're having, she's having with her husband. So one of the challenges we had was actually the unavailability of participants. And so remember I said we were visiting them twice a month. And so the interviewers had to keep going to their households. These are rural areas, houses are sparse, and they had to keep going there. Another point was, again, about an availability of participants, the, a good number did not also have phones. So again, they couldn't uh, make appointments to really ask, uh, I mean, be able to know when they can meet the woman. So those were two things that kept coming out and became a challenge for us during the project. So you've seen the social uh, support issue, and we'll also look at the other one. So research positionality. One of the things that the, the interviewers went through was literally living in the space of where the participant was, actualizing what the participant was experiencing at that point. And therefore, you find uh, the interviewers had a lot of um, things affecting how they, 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 their perspectives on what was going on. And so one of the things was a woman who was depressed, he, she was recommended to see a counselor, but she said she cannot do it because her husband will beat her once she gets, once he gets to know. And so the, the I mean, the, the researcher was now um, at a crossroad. He, he knew that this was important for her because of her status, but then she was like, you know what? I don't want you to tell anyone about what's going on. And so there was that part of, you know, what uh, the positionality of that researcher. The second one is about, you know, being in the middle of it. The participant is angry, leaves the child with the, uh, with the researcher to go and make noise to the mother-in-law. And so she's there, you know, she has to report on these observations, but then she has to factor in all these emotions that are going around. And the third one was, we gave them reimbursement instead of uh, the participant reimbursement uh, monetary. We decided to give them food because of food insecurity that was going on at that point in those households. And so again, you find the interviewers had to keep reminding the, the participants to live their normal life. Because now, you know, I have food. I didn't have food. So if you're observing that woman at that point, your objectivity is again uh, um, affected because of what you are seeing at that point. 
And one of the things that we did was to tell them to keep having reflection of what they see at the end of the day. And therefore that reflection helped them to keep, uh, to keep their mind objective in what they saw. They would have reflection, put down questions they wanted to ask the participant at the next visit. And therefore that helped them keep uh, the, the, the observation objective. <laughs> so what, what worked? Rapport, as I said, we did two visits every month for four months. And so therefore the women became uh, more free. They, they became more free and they were able to share whatever it is they were going through. And this worked for us because even during those you know, emotional outbursts, um, even when, I mean, uh, when they were down because of challenges with, the, with their pregnancy or because of childbirth, we were able to be there with them. And so the flexibility also helped a lot because we followed them wherever they went. Be it in the hospital, we went with them. Be it uh, after they delivered, we went to see them. So that engagement really helped in them opening up and also just having um, that connection to be able to say what it is that was going on through their minds. And of course, household content was important. We had two uh, field interviewers, a man and a woman. And so for this man to continuously uh, you know, interview the woman, move around with the woman, we had to get the consent of the, of the household head, who was a man. And so once that was done, it was easier for us to continue observing the woman. And also not just limiting the woman as the unit of observation, but we are also interacting with her social environment. That also helped a lot in getting to know and to see all these other factors that are interplay in terms of her own life. And so, as I finish, this is what one woman says. She is pregnant, there is need of financial support, but she doesn't have it, and therefore she aims, I mean, she ends up going to the farm to do the work that she says she can't do because of her advanced pregnancy. And so it goes back to show again another determinant which I had mentioned earlier, poverty, you know, and the lack of social support and what women go through that can lead to mental stress. And so as I finish, this is what it says. Apart from physical health, mental health during pregnancy and after childbirth is very critical. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Um, while we're setting up the next slide, I would like to introduce our next speaker. Um, just before I do that, just a reminder to our in-person and online audience that there will be a QA and a um, after the speakers are done. So please just jot down your questions or comments um, and let's try and keep them brief so that we can have a really engaging discussion during the Q&A. Um, our next speaker is uh, Mona Bome, serves at, and she serves as a program director for Christian Connections for International Health and the program director for the faith engagement team of um, Momentum Country and Global Leadership. Mona directs a global portfolio of initiatives that improve timely access to quality health services in communities and facilities by working with faith, sorry, by working with faith-based partners and um, Christian members around the world. She holds a master's in philosophy from University of Minnesota School of Public Health. And Mona <laughs> will be discussing her, uh, her study on engaging faith communities on maternal mental health. Uh, Mona, you can go ahead. Hi, can everyone hear me? I hope it's okay. I'll just keep talking unless someone tells me it's not working. Um, thank you for the inclusion in these discussions and uh, the generous welcome. Uh, hopefully everyone can see my slides. Yes, we can. Yes, I can. Great. Yeah. Um, 
So just a little bit of background. Uh, we believe that religious leaders, traditional and faith healers, pastors, imams, and other faith actors are often some of the most respected voices in their communities who naturally shape community attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. Um, but we also know that faith actors um, can help facilitate dialogue on mental well-being, provide theological dimensions of mental health, uh, promote positive mental health behaviors and services in their communities. But when faith actors are not equipped, there have been cases where they have spread negative stereotypes, stigmatized these experiences of mental disorders. And so that's just a bit of background to start. And I'm trying to be a little bit interactive. We'll see how it works, but I don't know if folks have used Menti before, um, but if on your phone or your computers, you can pull up menti.com um, and put this code in. I'll have it on a few slides. I'm gonna come back to this later, um, but would love your feedback on this question and we'll come back to it. So um, you'll see the code on subsequent slides if you don't get it right this second. So we did a literature review, review um, because we recognize that common perinatal mental health disorders are the leading complication of pregnancy and childbirth globally. And I want to share a few of our highlights from this 2021 literature review on faith-based engagement in maternal mental health. Uh, we included 40 documents that met our search criteria. And I, I won't read each bullet, but an example of the first bullet, um, of supportive religious communities was pastors accompanying women to healthcare and delivery to provide comfort through prayer um, and other means. And for the second bullet, some examples range from um, child marriage to social pressure to have male babies, um, harmful power dynamics, spiritual healing centers that inflicted extreme harm. So those are just some examples positive or seen as negative from the literature review. Um, and I'll include the link later to the results from that literature review. We also conducted key informant interviews. Uh, we screened from a list of 92, narrowed down to 31, and of those 16 completed the key informant interviews. We had representatives from India, Kenya, <clears throat> Malawi, Ghana, Liberia, Nigeria, and then a few multinational representatives. And the findings from the key informant interviews were very in line with what we found in the literature review. So there was nothing very surprising. Um, we, you know, how could they be helpful? What are their needs? And I don't think also that these needs are very um, different than what most community or programs need in order to help them uh, address maternal mental health issues. Uh, I pulled out some quotes from the key informant interviews. I'm just going to focus on one of them where it says many women, for example, with psychosis get a wide range of support from churches and mosques, ranging from fairly helpful, whether formal or informal, to inappropriate, judgmental, and sometimes quite abusive. Uh, for example, all night prayer vigils that blame the woman for her condition. So I think what we we saw a lot in the literature review and the key informant interviews was um, the positive, the helpful, and the what can be seen as really negative and destructive. And so those those are the results from the literature review and key informant. Of course, with time, I'm just I'm I'm glimpsing over everything. Um, and so what we did based on the literature review and key informant interviews is we conducted a series of virtual consultations to then create a toolkit for engaging faith actors as change agents for maternal mental health. So instead of perpetuating problems or stigma, um, we want faith actors to be agents of change <laughs> in a positive way. And so this is a busy slide. It just shows you what the toolkit looks like and the content. And I'm going to highlight a few pieces um, from the toolkit. There's a QR code there, but I'll also include the link to the toolkit later in the chat box. Um, and hopefully those will be shared in addition with those in person. Um, and so just one highlight from the toolkit is we know the perinatal period is a high risk period for mental health risk factors. And so we included signs and symptoms in table one of the toolkit. 
And so I'm assuming that most of us who are interested in this topic know all of these things, but the toolkit is uh, geared towards lay leaders. It's geared towards faith leaders who are not health experts, right? And so that is why we try to make the toolkit um, friendly to what we would say a lay audience. Um, so this is just example of one table in the toolkit. And then another table in the toolkit that is highlighted um, is based on outcomes. So once again, highlighting that um, a mother's own physical health, her functioning, her quality of life, as well as um, the physical, emotional um, health of the child, the brain development of her children can be impacted. And so these are just two tables that were included in the toolkit to help faith actors, once again, who aren't experts, um, understand. And then another part of the toolkit is really focusing on faith-specific messages. Um, so here are just three pieces that I pulled from the toolkit from three different faith traditions. Uh, there's much more detail in the toolkit with more examples of messages and examples of social media messages. And when I say social media, that could include WhatsApp <laughs> um, for each faith tradition. And what was very similar that we found from the feedback was it was important to include a message on mental health is not a punishment from God, from Allah. It is not karma, depending on your faith tradition. And so the the important piece of all of this is it's a global toolkit, but we hope that anyone who uses it contextualizes it, of course, for their country, for the language, for the education level of their audience. And we're hoping it will be um, a resource for people to use with different faith traditions. Um, and so what I'd love to do now <laughs> is I'm gonna go back to Menti. And so if you haven't pulled Menti up, you'll see the code. Um, and then I'll just show this last slide before I move to Menti. Um, so you can see the, the link, but let me share. I have to go, Ooh, where did it go? Sorry. Hmm. Sorry, everybody, it's not letting me pull up Menti. There we go. Okay, it looks like three people have responded. <laughs> Is it letting you see the full screen, everyone? Yes, it's good, we can see. Okay, great, four responses. And so, I, you know, we were asked to do, try to do something interactive <laughs> with our time. And so I was just really curious, you know, what has worked to engage faith communities on mental health? What are some successes from your perspective? Um, I could have also asked about challenges, but because of time, I chose to be positive. <laughs> and so I appreciate, I, I think trust is a key key point, and I appreciate that. Um, looks like leveraging internal skilled and knowledgeable advocates for well-being, treating faith leaders as equal partners in research, absolutely. Using ex existing support structures and groups, very true. No need to create something new. Um, most faith traditions have their own structures. Um and partnering and collaborating with faith leaders who have a pre-existing relationship, absolutely. Um, combating isolation through churches and communities. Oh, and I like this point about um, even intergenerationally, the relationship maybe with grandparents. And I know depending on the community, there's been, um, what is the nice way to say, complications working with in-laws or the mother-in-law. It just depends on the community. Um, having a village, different pieces. So I appreciate you all playing along. You're welcome to um, contribute more on what has worked for you to engage with faith communities. Um, my time is almost up. I have my timer sitting next to me. <laughs> so thank you all very much. And I am enjoying the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mona. Our next uh, speaker is Sarah Mlambo. Uh, she holds a PhD and a master's in science in nursing and is a midwifery lecturer at Walwichia University in Namibia. Her experience in nursing and midwifery spans over a de 
decade in public and private sector settings in Namibia and Zimbabwe. She has published research in midwifery, decision-making, child birth choice facilitation, and positive maternal mental health outcomes. She is currently a committee member on the National Maternal Stillbirth and Death Review Committee of Namibia and Gold Midwifery Professional Advisory Committee member. Most importantly, she's a proud mother of four wonderful children. So Sarah will be uh, taking us through her talk on indigenous knowledge systems as a social determinant for improvement of maternal mental health outcomes. Sarah, please go ahead. Thank you very much um, for this opportunity. I'll be taking you through Indigenous knowledge systems as a social determinant for improving maternal mental health. This is really a work in progress um, to be done and is quite exciting conversation um, in the field of maternal mental health, which has got amazing potential as we look for sustainability in ensuring that women and uh, their families have got uh, good perinatal outcomes as well as also maternal um, outcomes when they are pregnant um, and um, making sure that um, we include and provide for a safe space for the indigenous uh, people. Can you see the screen? Uh, yes, Sarah. Um, I think there's been some corruption with your slides okay. um, so that the text is not showing nicely, but luckily we've got a backup. So okay. if, if you are, if you would just pause a second and we will try and pull up your backup presentation and then we will present for you and you can speak. Does that, how does that sound? That's all right. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, the slides, we're not seeing the text um, come up at all. Um, um, so if you can just stop sharing. Okay. Um, and then maybe see if you can, uh, we can still see, your, I'm not too sure if we can see your face, probably not, but we will get the correct presentation out. Could you go back to the... Um, is it the same? Okay. Maybe she did it the same. Can we swap with the person? Um, okay. Sarah, would it be possible if we swap with Josephine and we move to Josephine? And maybe can you look, but I don't know if the slides show the same way for you, okay. but there essentially we only see signs. It looks like it's been sort of changed. The font may have been changed to sign. Um. Or something. Okay. I don't know how you see it. It's perfect. Yeah. Okay, try to put it up. Okay, we're trying to show it now. Just we've got. Second. We've got it. Um, <clears throat> we just get. We're going to be. Um, if you're happy with it, we'll we'll present for you while you That's speak. Fine. Okay. I think I think we're ready to go. Well, let's test it on the screen first. Yeah, we'll test it on the screen here to see whether that corruption of the font persists. Oh, we can yeah. read it. Okay. Yeah, and that, that looks much better. Try it. Um, can you go to the next one? Is it was the one underneath that is correct? Maybe you can read out. Looking good. Thanks for everybody's patience. Yeah, all these surprises. <laughs> Yay, it's working. Great. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay. So, um, Car Carolyn will um, do your presentation, and if you just ask her to move. proceed when you're ready, just tell me to move to the next slide. Now, directly. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. So, as I was saying, um. Maternal mental health is really a problem, especially in the African context, due to its uh, stigma, as well as um, a lot of cultural components that surrounds it. However, it is also um, can be one of the get-throughs 
as well as um, a way of sustenance as we look into how we can incorporate culture and the indigenous knowledge systems into ensuring that we have women who are having positive outcomes at the ends of their pregnancies. So the problem has already been stated. The problem is there. We know that maternal uh, mental problems, they do affect um, one in seven, about one in seven women who are pregnant and 10% of, the uh, of them are actually pregnant. So helping women at the beginning of preconception care as well as pregnancy will help us as midwives, will help us as the health fraternity to ensure that we do have uh, positive outcomes in terms of our mental health. A good mental health in um, women actually helps for the family to be sustainable, for also to know that we have happy children and uh, a good workforce out there as well. So 13% also we know that um, it is among the women who have also just birthed and have a mental disorder with um, depression being the most common. And depression in Africa, um, especially in my cultural background, it's a very difficult word or component to explain to somebody that you are having depression. There is no actual word that is um, mainly focusing on depression in the positive uh, connotations. However, so to say in my culture, for you to say you've got mental problems is like you are crazy or kupenga. So it is not um, something which anybody, any mother, any woman will be able to uh, express. And um, feeling of overwhelm, of anxiety upon giving birth, a um, series of feelings that many women uh, undergo. However, without proper screening, they may not be able to determine that they are actually going into depression. So there is quite prevalence among pregnant uh, women. We know that um, women do have uh, issues with uh, feeling of being overwhelmed. Thank you, we can move to the next slide, please. Okay, so in the African tradition based uh, mainly on the Zimbabwean culture, which is also can be interlinked with uh, cultures like India and also uh, some cultures here in Namibia, we understand the Masungiro aspect, which is a Shona word, which specifically means that a woman, especially during the first uh, pregnancy, uh, they go to their um, mothers or to their aunts where there is an environment that they are well acquainted with. They are taken there for help and to be taught on motherhood, to be taught on what to expect in labor. This space is actually a space which um, the woman feels safe. And if we look at um, the World Health Organization, when it talks about companionship, especially in pregnancy and birth, it is mainly because of the safe space that the woman is going to feel, and which also encourages positive outcomes during childbirth as well as postpartum. So the Masungiro aspect actually helps the woman to feel safe to be confident uh, in terms of uh, the birth that is pertinent, that lies ahead. And this system can actually be integrated or can be adopted within the health uh, spectrum for us to create a safe space for women. As we know that uh, with other problems that we know, forced migration, um, urbanization, all that uh, is hindering the social norms or the cultural aspects that we have um, known to be the norm in Africa. And within this Masungiro, this is where a woman is uh, taken through Masuo, Masuo, which is uh, in, translated into English as uh, perineal massage. And as such, um, the parent, the mother, the aunt, or the sister in the absence of mothers is the one who goes and directs how perineal massage, which also reduces a lot of um, uh, birth trauma during childbirth. And all this, we know that uh, if a woman uh, suffers um, perineal trauma, 
and there's not so much support, it also contributes uh, to a greater extent to the postpartum uh, recovery period. And most women can also have uh, depression uh, in that manner. So the Makorokoto aspect that I've also put there is an indigenous knowledge um, system attribute that I just want to bring about, which also um, talks about Ubuntu. Makorokoto means congratulations. However, the response to Makorokoto is always Nde Edu meaning that this congratulations is for all of us. So a woman, when they give birth in a community, the community is equally responsible for the health and the well-being of the mother and the baby. So this is um, an indigenous system that can be adopted through community midwifery in our different communities so that those who have been displaced either by climate change that have been displaced by urbanization that have been displaced even by uh, globalization as we are in different spaces uh, looking for jobs and creating opportunities for ourselves. However, the mental health of the women sh still needs to be um, looked into and um, helped uh, to make sure that women have positive health outcomes. If you can move the next slide, please. So these are the challenges that I've also just uh, spoken about, globalization and urbanization. We have stigma, which we cannot rule out. I think uh, one of the speakers before me alluded to this, that um, we may look at um, culture as being stigmatized. We know that we have a lot of um, maternal mortalities that are happening. Some may be attributed to the stigma that is happening. And also, there can be also ignorance. As I have alluded, uh, Masungiro aspect or the socialization that comes with it is a positive determinant, a social determinant, because we know that um, socialization is what makes us or breaks us. And it is important for us to know exactly within the cultures that we are working with, what makes them and what can we adapt? Not everything can be um, regarded as redundant. The mental health as well as the perennial trauma that comes with it, it is uh, uh, issues of concern. And these are challenges that need to be addressed by us as healthcare professionals. Thank you. If you can move to the next slide. So it, to maintain sustainability, what can we do? It is raining. However, we need to adapt. We need to improve uh, on whatever systems that we have. However, we need to find out where the rain began to beat us, as a Chinua Achebe once said. Where exactly did we go wrong? It is true we have uh, maternal challenges uh, where everywhere in the world, but how can these indigenous knowledge systems help us to adapt and to create, especially in low middle income countries where we do not have good um, economic status uh, and we have minimal resources? How can we make use of these uh, indigenous systems to better the lives of women in our communities. So a three to Dr. 60 Sarah, degree approach. Sorry, you okay. have one minute, one minute, thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much. It's okay. So we have a three, we should have a 360 approach, which um, includes midwives, doctors, but most importantly, the women who are the main actors in this um, health for them to be able to give us what um, they expect or how the Masungiro aspect of these systems have helped them previously. An indigenous approach, which talks about internal forces rather than external forces for sustainability, quality education and healthcare, which is quite inclusive with um, um, Western medicine as well as indigenous system. Economic stability um, for minimal resources, how can we use them? And um, in conclusion, the social and family support, we know it is a um, very good determinant and which the World Health Organization also alludes to, for us to have good sustainable uh, development goals to achieve the 2030 vision, as well as end preventable maternal deaths. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Josephine Appelot. 
She is a clinical psychologist experienced in research aimed at integrating social determinants in mental health and psychosocial support, as well as designing, training, supervising, and implementing interventions in low, in low resource settings. Currently, Josephine is pursuing her PhD studies at, oh, I'm going to butcher this name, Verge <laughs> University. I'm sorry to all the Dutch <laughs> in Amsterdam. <laughs> um, she will be uh, taking us through her discussion on the evolution of a maternal mental health program for conflict affected countries. Please go ahead, Josephine. Thank you very much, and thank you for assisting me with the name. <laughs> so, yeah, um, with me uh, and our colleagues, uh, I hope you can hear me well. Yes, we can. Thank you. I have Professor Brandon Alan Cohort. Uh, he's one of the attendees, and he will be joining um, when there's need uh, during the Q&A. And then I have um, he's from George Washington University and also my mentor and supervisor, clinical uh, PhD supervisor. And then I have um, was Samuel Wasereka, Health Right International. He's also among the attendees. And then two other colleagues who have not been able to join this at all, my, my supervisor as well as Dr. Nawaraj Mudia. Just wanted to make sure we have those. And uh, uh, this picture is to welcome you to Uganda when you get time to come and tour uh, for self care. Come and see the black elephants of Uganda. And so the evolution uh, of our approaches to integrating maternal mental health in, in, in maternal and child health, uh, child health. I was informed by a few of the studies. It's been there for some time in Uganda that we do not have comprehensive national prevalence studies, either on mental health or even showing that the, the relationship between the social determinants and mental health and uh, or perinatal depression. So we have a number of pocket studies which, uh, I mean, target different aspects. Uh, one such example, targeted the illness representation in which um, women are seen as the fault for having the depression there is their own fault. And then we have examples like uh, uh, the Arach et al. study in which they see um, the death of children during the perinatal stage as a cause of increased postpartum depression and then we have evidences on evidence-based interventions which work and those which integrate um, um, this uh, perinatal depression research in HIV or other uh, terminal illnesses. So we definitely have, um, our vision is that we see perinatal depression alone as well as social determinants alone as a complex problems. And then when these two are combined together, it worsens the complexity of the problems. And dealing with uh, conflict-affected populations, you know Uganda hosts a number of um, refugees. We've seen that they face a number of um, social issues and social problems which actually aggregate, aggravate the mental health um, problems that they have. So, but then integration uh, for our approach is that we're looking at integration. It should come from the government system for the reasons that I will tell you through our approach that it doesn't work without the government system. And it should be a step-by-step -step approach and it should be a general, we should all prioritize it. And so the steps are, one is to begin with a formative research. And then in that, I will tell you what we found out and then develop a care model which should be appropriate to the needs of the mothers. And then as you provide the care, learn lessons and use those lessons to improve the uptake and adherence of the services. And then 
at that point begin to integrate the social determinants. So that's the approach we took. And so in the, sorry, not, not in formative, it's supposed to be formative, sorry for that. We did a stakeholder engagement. And with this, we were able to identify the conditions, the way people refer to distress or the way people refer, refer to some mental health uh, conditions. For example, in Ateso, it's Adekana Omisho, meaning sickness of thoughts. And then um, in Luo, it is Potam. And so it is better to use this even when we are using the, when we want to identify or use screening tools, use the reference that people are, are using and they are known to, to be able to detect uh, actual depression, say, among mothers. So this is what this formative research focused on. But key to this, uh, we were able to uh, identify salient issues. Uh, among those was the social issue of husbands being absent. And this literally meant they absent psychologically, but also absent physically. So when they needed any support, uh, this support would not be provided because of the absenteeism that they referred to. This study has already been published and uh, it can be accessed, uh, it was done in 2018. But we are also going, we are working on a paper which is soon coming out on how we use this information to validate the primary health care questionnaire to a nine using the local uh, languages that people referred to and that they understood more. In the second step, uh, I hope I'm not too fast. In the second step, we developed the care model uh, based on what the people, uh, the community members told us, that before you begin to screen, you need to know how we refer. And that's what we did, we, we, the wordings that we picked from them, the idioms that they used to refer to the mental health problems. And then we screened using these tools after we've adapted them. And then we had uh, also determined the cutoff scores. So for the patient health patient, there are two with a cutoff score of two or more. Those ones would qualify to be uh, screened using the primary health questionnaire nine. And so we categorized also the care to begin with psych education and then um, referral to the next level which was either psychosocial support management or psychiatric management. So in this, we were using, uh, if you can look at the last, the left-hand axis, we used midwives, but along the way, we also learned our lessons that midwives are too busy. And so we decided to use the community healthcare workers. However, we were able to, in the period of four years after adapting this, the screeners, we were able to screen over 22,000 mothers. Um, I hope you're able to see this. And then um, uh, of this, 26% were depressed, 79 improved on psych education, uh, had reduction of symptoms of psych education, 89% on the interpersonal group therapy. And then we had um, 79% recording improved functioning. Still, we, our lesson there was the challenge that we lost many women to follow up and care between steps because of the restriction placed by their husbands or their movements. Some of them would be sent to distant um, places to go and dig so that they do not come and share secrets with the people who were providing care. So then we thought about a solution of male involvement and um, this took us to the third step in which we provided um, a program on task shifting uh, capacity building for the lay healthcare providers so that they would be able to reach out to the mothers wherever they could be and especially try to focus within their localized settings. And then um, later on, we built the capacity of these people using the competence-based approach uh, through uh, a study led by Dr. Brandon, 
And in this, it provides us a chance to, to train people and then um, rate their capacities or, or rate their competencies during the training and after the training. And even when you go to supervise, it is not a guess, but it is factual that you're using the tools to be able to rate whether somebody is competent or not in that we are reducing harm and then reducing the costs on actual supervision that you would be doing during the intervention. So you can also find the details on the equip, um, ensuring quality psychosocial support training and supervision approach. And then we decided then to go ahead and involve men and we had to develop uh, different tools to retool the project um, intervention um, aids. For example, we had a psychoeducation tool which we had to re redesign to involve men so that men have a message can be able to see what they can do at what point they can be able to join in, like the pro it's something to guide the men instead of just talking to them. And of course, in order to address the low service uptake, the poor here is that we had registered and then we had also known that there was alcohol and intimate personal violence, which was reported by the women. But we couldn't work with that. Sorry. Uh, I'm about to finish. All right. Sorry. So this general. is all right. So this is one of the tools for guiding men. Uh, it's called the say, a health education sensitization uh, tool, which was used in outpatient departments. And then we wanted also to prove, besides what the women were saying, that they were being uh, abused or violated at home, and then the men were drinking, we wanted to prove this. And it actually came out from this uh, impacts approach in which we integrated mental health in the home household at the household level using the community structures. And so men, uh, this is the model that we used. And then the men say they were also thinking too much. And because of that, they were using alcohol as a coping mechanism. They were aware that they were abusing. They were very violent at home. And so we used this as the third stage to integrate uh, social determinants. However, for my discussion for today, I know that we've talked about um, involving communities, we talked about challenges of stigma, but my question is, are we looking at mental health and, and focusing perinatal mental health for mothers, or should we step out of the rim and look at mental health, uh, perinatal depression as a complex problem, likewise social determinants as a complex problem, and thus change our research lens from being uh, confined into the mental health experts to looking at the transdisciplinary definitions of these conditions and trying to look at the transdisciplinary uh, responses to this. So when you look at this, um, um, my ecological drawing here, we are adapting interventions, but we need to adapt interventions which cut across the mother as a person who target, then the family, community, and the policy. Without involving the government, we just cannot succeed because we did not manage to scale what we were doing because initially we were working without the government involvement. So then we need also to look at, uh, if we're talking about intimate partner violence, is that the cause of the mental health or is there something causing the social determinants itself? So stepping out of the rim beyond the actual cause that we tend to focus on and look at the underlying cause of the social determinant beyond the perinatal mental health. And then how do we design re or co design? I'm, I'm happy that uh, Simone talked about on Nicole, say that we need to co-design. Oh, and so we need really to co-design, change the methods and determine various ways to measure all the courses that we are targeting. So welcome to collaborate with us as we plan to scale. I would like to thank Health Right International 
uh, represented by Samuel Wasirika, who was formerly Peter C. Alderman Foundation and the field teams that participated in these stages. We are also writing papers uh, myself, Dr. Vitse Toll, Dr. Brandon. Uh, we're writing papers on <laughs> this maternal mental health as well as the adaptation studies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Josephine. Our final speaker for the session is Victoria Mutiso. She's a clinical psychologist and a senior researcher at Africa Institute of Mental and Brain Health. Her research interest is on child and adolescent mental health, development and adaptation of culturally appropriate interventions around promotion of mental well-being and prevention of or delay of the onset of mental illness in young people, as well as underserved and marginalized populations. And she looks at this in Kenyan urban and rural settings. Uh, Victoria also has several publications on various aspects of public mental health in Kenya. Uh, Victoria will be taking us through her talk on intimate partner violence, a risk factor for postnatal depression in rural Kenya. Thank you, Victoria, please, you can go ahead. Thank you very much for that introduction. Do I need to turn on my camera, perhaps just for people to put a face to that name? Um, can you all see me? We can see you online, but unfortunately we haven't set up at this stage to see people. Um, no problem. In the, in the room, but maybe when we have questions, we'll see you online. Sorry, Victoria. Absolutely, but you can you all hear me? Beautifully. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So thanks so much for that intro. Um, I will be speaking to you about intimate partner violence, which we found as a risk factor for postnatal depression. And I'm currently working with Africa Institute of Mental and Brain Health, which is formerly the Africa Mental Health Research and Training Foundation. It's based in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, for some reason, I'm not able to move my slides um, um are you controlling slides from your you've you've shared your screen is that correct i think i did unless i stop share and then someone from your end can help me control this the slides okay um you're not able to proceed at all no it's just stuck okay. on this first slide okay we can we can use your backup presentation Sure, um, let me just then, stop sharing. Victoria, okay. yeah, could you try share and uh, unshare and share again and see if maybe then you can see the button? Sure. Ah, we can see you now at least for a moment, which is very nice. Right, let me try and share again. Uh, let's, uh, Jemima, before you change, let's give her a one second. Let's see if it works. Okay, we can see your presentation. If you go into presenter mode. There you go. So it's working. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your patience. I have an echo. I don't know what the problem is. Do you all hear me well? Beautifully. Great. Thank you. So thank you all so much for inviting me to this great conversations about maternal mental health in Africa. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about um, the conclusions and any recommendations that may come from this conference. And I do really want to appreciate the speakers that went ahead of me, because I am just sort of repeating what has uh, been said earlier on. So this is the outline of my presentation. I'll be talking to you about the introduction of the study. I'll talk to you about the objectives and talk to you a little bit about the methods and a few of the results that we were able to find and conclusion and then look at uh, some potential interventions that we recommended uh, when we finished our study. So a bit of intro. Um, Postpartum depression, as we know, occurs within the first 12 months after delivery. It's really a, a universal mental health problem that's affecting uh, the quality of life of the mother and their optimal well-being, including the caregiving capacity of the mother and 
more often than not, that also um, affects the child. So we do know that there is a high uh, prevalence of postpartum depression in Africa, and that includes Kenya, as the earlier speakers have also alluded to within their countries. So it's important then to determine the contributing factors or risk factors to this high prevalence, and also taking into consideration the cultural diversity among African countries and also the diversity within the same country, because we know, for example, in African countries, we might have um, different uh, settings and cultural differences, even within the country itself. So we looked at, uh, we were aiming to achieve three objectives. We wanted to determine the prevalence of postpartum depression. And we were looking at four domains uh, within the intimate partner violence, um, the physical violence, sexual violence, emotional violence, and controlling behavior. And for our objective two, we wanted to determine the co-occurrence of postpartum depression, and intimate partner violence. And in our objective three, we wanted to determine the risk factors and associations between sociodemographic variables and postpartum depression, as well as um, intimate partner violence. We didn't uh, look out for any biological factors, but the social determinants of mental ill health among mothers who had delivered within the, that period. This study was funded by Grand Challenges Canada, and we did, uh, it was part of a bigger study that was funded between 2016 and towards the end of 2017. So we conducted a cross-sectional study involving a cohort of 554 uh, postpartum mothers that were attending primary health care in, in rural Kenya. So we recruited them between the six weeks to 12 months post-delivery. And the six weeks was because that is when the, uh, the mothers who have delivered come to the clinic the first time. So we were being careful not to lose women before uh, they come in for the, 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 the first time. Um, postnatal clinic. So our sample size was 544 mothers. So we also used sociodemographic questionnaire and we also used the WHO intimate partner violence questionnaire and looking at uh, also used the mini plus for ICD, DSM-4, looking at depression. Our analysis were descriptive, and we also looking, we, we looked at uh, linear, regre linear regression analysis to see which were the most important um, risk factors that may have contributed to postpartum depression. So um, some of the results, we, we I, I, as I mentioned, this was a, part of a bigger study. So these are some of the results that I thought I would share in this uh, meeting. Um, and physical violence turned out to be the most important predictor of postpartum uh, depression, post-delivery in our study. If you look at the graph on the side, uh, emotional violence um, was determined as the highest um, prevalence or, or or contributed to the highest uh, prevalence within the four domains followed by the controlling behavior and then we had physical violence um, and then sexual violence uh, all together contributing to postpartum depression but when we looked at the sociodemographic characteristics certain sociodemographic characteristics really stood out uh, low socioeconomic status of the mother and indeed the family, uh, self-employed status as a woman, and low education level were very important uh, sociodemographic characteristics that stood out in this study as being risk factors um, for, for postpartum depression. 
Um, postpartum depression uh, was also associated with the physical, as I mentioned, physical and sexual violence during pregnancy, and also a history of mood disorders, as an, an, an earlier speaker had alluded to, that um, mental disorders um, and medical problems in the child also tended to uh, be a precipitating factor to postpartum depression. Um, this paper has also been uh, published and it, it has a, a few more uh, results that can be looked at. But given the time, I was not able to put everything on this, on this uh, presentation. So some of our conclusions were that, um, you know, and the most important is that postpartum depression and intimate partner violence were really highly prevalent in our population of the 544 mothers. And then the various social demographic indicators, um, the ones I mentioned, you know, low education level, um, being self-employed, and some of the women who didn't have any form of income, as, as well as sexual and physical violence were significantly associated with postpartum depression. So quantifying the prevalence of postpartum depression and identifying the different associated factors, including the understanding of the local sociocultural context, provide useful information to guide interventions. As I said, this was a cross-sectional study that really gave a lot of highlights in what can be done in the future. We we had potential interventions that um, we, because we did this work at a primary healthcare clinic where the women were receiving uh, pre and postnatal care at the primary healthcare level. So we had conversations with the frontline healthcare workers, the nurses, community health promoters who provided information on all aspects of good prenatal and postnatal health. We, what we did was that, um, we had Victoria, did you mute yourself by accident? Uh, front uh, line healthcare work. Um, recommend now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. I'm back. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Victoria, I think we're having an issue with your mic or a network issue. And the, yes. No? No, it's patchy. It's patchy. Anyway, I'll yeah, I'll leave can, this. We can hear you now. I'll leave. I'll leave this slide on the screen, but otherwise that's my last slide. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak to the conference in the last 10 minutes. Thank you. I'll leave this on the screen unless there's another speaker. So I need to stop sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victoria, and to all our speakers in this session. Um, again, apologies to everyone for the few technical glitches, but this is how it goes within this um, uh, fourth industrial revolution and AI, you know, <laughs> um, technological sort of period we're in now. I'd like to open the floor now, uh, both online and in person for your questions and comments. Um, and I think someone will be helping me with the mic. Are there any questions? I'll start with in person. Are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. The mic yes. is coming. Um, yeah, just reflecting on the really wonderful range of different things that have been spoken about. I 
Yeah, Lucy November from King's College London. Um, just reflecting on the, the, you know, all the different range of things we've spoken about, and it just occurs to me, it's a comment really that, you know, these social determinants of, of mental, of pain and for mental health, that happen in communities, you know, isolation, loneliness, stigma, gender-based violence, and it feels like when you look at the different solutions proffered, that actually solving those problems in the communities is also the, the place to solve them, and so it, it just, and that's the, the speaker from Ethiopia was, um, and Guinea was making things about how, you know, sometimes we sit in the health sector and we think that all the solutions have to come from the health sector. Um, and then, you know, we maybe, you think, well, the solution is to train people who are already overstretched. And actually, the source of people's mental distress sometimes is coming from the behavior of the people in the health sector. And yet, we still want to put the solution to that within the health sector. And actually hearing from different people about their different solutions, it seems that, you know, this kind of indigenous, like that, that talk about the indigenous solutions, you know, we, we, we Ngendra and I together are running a project which is community-based for um, present teenagers. And it really, it, we call it a loving auntie model. And really it's about having that, that adult, that, that confidential kind, human kindness in your life. Um, which seems a bit less kind of formal and complicated. Um, I'm not saying that's the only solution, but I think it's really good to hear this range between the health sector and actually just empowering communities to solve the problems that are there in the communities. This is a problem. Thank you. Does anyone want to add on online or in person um, to that uh, contribution or to ask a question? I'm just looking at Nicole for online. Okay, can can I continue with in person for now? Yeah, there's a question um, so that people in the audience can hear me. Thank you. There's a question from someone anonymous um, who says, considering interventions, would you not consider interventions to reduce IPD? It seems that would be one of the best ways to reduce PPD. I'm not sure who this is directed I, to. I think our last speaker, Victoria, because you spoke on um, intimate partner violence. Absolutely, yes. Um, we would consider interventions um, to reduce IPV. Um, in fact, one of our recent um, grants that um, were funded soon after this, we were looking, we were recruiting men um, as perpetrators, uh, and, and it will, it's a mis mixed methods um, approach looking at what, what would be the issues that men are going through, either mental health issues or uh, economic issues or otherwise um, that would really contribute to um, IPV. So we we have certain results coming out as as men are actually speaking out in terms of their mental health issues as one of their biggest contributing factor to IPV. And uh, yes, I see a question: uh, Is Kenya still using TBS? Yes, we are. We are working a lot with tra traditional healers and faith healers. I was really excited. Um, to hear and listen to one of our colleagues who um, is talking about uh, working with faith-based and I'm really looking forward to hearing more about that. I have looked at the link and I am really excited about the work. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Are there any questions? Yes, Estelle. Thank you. Thank you. Um... I think for me, I, I like the presentation, but, but for me, it's also a comment, like for the uh, the whole, I would say, community of practice, working on prenatal mental health, especially in Africa. So I, I think, Simone, you talked about the voltage analogy. When you're talking about the social determinants of prenatal mental health, it's really, for me, an iceberg analogy. We try to solve the problem, looking at the tip of the iceberg, but we really do not understand the social determinants way in depth really what causes the problem we are seeing. So it's also called in more and more in-depth sociological inquiries 
around the social determinants of mental health within the African settings, because we, we're really rushing in terms of adapting toolkits, interventions, without really understanding the fabric of the society. Because as we said at the beginning, most of those things happen in, in cultures where mental health is not even a word. We don't have word for mental health in most cultures. When women do not want to speak about mental health, because they, immediately when you see I'm depressed, they look at you like you're a weak mother, a weak woman. So really, we have to continue really understanding the, the base of the iceberg. Really, when talking about IPV, we did this study recently with uh, funds from NIH in the US, and realized when we're talking about H and IPV and, and mental health, we basically limit your understanding about your know, interactions within the couple and what actually creates stress for mothers and how do we use and strengthen, you know, even men as agents of promoting mental health among mothers. So we stopped talking about IPV really in our study, but looking at issues around relationship quality, issues around marital expectations among mothers, what creates those, you know, internal conflict within couples that actually creates stress among mothers. So I think it's, for me, just encouraging, you know, the community of practice to go really in depth when we're talking about the social determinant, not just looking at these as a little social economic status and all that, but really understanding uh, the social fabrics. Thanks. Thank you, Estelle. Uh, Nicole, is there an online question or comment? Uh, no new questions online. All right, so we'll carry on in person. Um, I see Simona's um, hand up. Uh, thanks. Just to responses to Estelle's um, call for understanding social determinants, I'm I, I'm not sure if, you're, if I agree. I think I think we understand what the social determinants are. We understand that when women are hungry, when they're displaced, when they are are experiencing uh, interpersonal violence or interpersonal uh, relationship issues when they're isolated, when they're in civil conflict situations, uh, when they have problems with their mother-in-law, we understand what the risk factors are, but what we don't understand is how to address them. So for me, I would like to see more work and innovation done in the space around interventions I mean, around, for, for these complex social determinants. How can we shift the needle like Josephine's work has done in, in Uganda, but how do they bring men into this space? How do they change their dynamic in the home? How can we work, how can we um, build the capacity of maternal and child health platforms or the NGO sector to bring in a food security component to what they do? Um, I'm not sure if you want to respond to that, but I think it's I think we need to innovate around interventions and 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 look at meaningful intersectoral collaboration. I think we often use that word very easily as armchair practitioners saying we should work together. But how does that actually happen? How do you get a nurse to to think about violence in the home? How do you get a midwife to think about hunger? How do you get an NGO who's providing food insecurity, food security to think about mental health? Um, yeah. Thank you. I'm the moderator. I've got, um, so I'm looking at my time closely. We've got three more minutes. I'm going to take one um, online and a last one will be our um, in person, she had a hand up first. If there's time, we'll come back to you. Please go ahead. Yeah, we've got a question online from Yasmin. Uh, I've just enabled you to unmute. Uh, Yasmin Graham, could you, would you like to ask your questions, please? Yes, thank you so much. My name's Jasmine Graham. I'm a professor out of the US at Wake Forest University, and I study um, women's mental health care throughout the female reproductive lifespan. And I really appreciate all of the content that's been shared, but to Estelle specifically, who just um, shared her wisdom and insight, I'm curious to know in the absence of language, how do the women themselves conceptualize or make sense of their experiences of distress? Thank you. Um, is, 
do any of the speakers want to respond to Yasmin's uh, question? I, I can attempt. Um, I, and, and this is something not just uh, specifically for women, but across the Kenyan context. And I had a colleague from Zimbabwe allude to that. We do not have one specific um, phrase or word to describe depression, how much, um, even if we try uh, to sort of pull together all the words and vocabulary to mean one word, but it helps for the women to describe how they feel in a in a story. Um, because depression and, and even postpartum depression cannot be defined in one word. Um, we held focus group discussions with uh, a, a section of the women and what this, they described were um, feelings and, you know, heart matters. And, you know, sometimes you could tell from the women e e expressions when they broke down that something was going on. So that's all I can say, unless our colleague from Zimbabwe who talked a bit about depression and how uh, they were able to elicit some of these conversations from the women is able to add. Thank you for that question, Jasmine. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, we have one last question from the floor. Okay, mine's not a question. It was more of a also comment. And um, it's just really, I'm hoping that we would have a broader like a communique uh, from this meeting today, because what seems to be coming up more and in terms of the interventions, you know, there's been so much research, but one commonality that we keep seeing from all the conversations is this gap between the informal and the formal, the formal education, the formal systems and the informal. And who, who, who can actually determine what the solution is if not the person most impacted and the community? So I think that it would be helpful, you know, like we're agreeing or we're, we're recommending that with any info, with any formal situation or research, what's the um, what's the quota of the input of the community so that the, the solutions are, uh, are local and more sustainable. And then when the interventions are also being proffered, it should come locally, because at times it's even the social capital that would make it sustainable. And then in terms of, uh, and that's a really quick one, in terms of the wording, when you ask this women, we, who needs to call it um, depression? You know, they know how to describe it, they know how they say it, and maybe in that context, it's also for formal researchers to learn how the local people see it and say it and pick it. So we shouldn't have one size fits all solution, and I hope that we can marry that into our future work. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. You summarized the whole session nicely for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much. Our time um, has come to an end. I just want to again thank our lovely speakers today for a very engaging and thought-provoking session. And um, I'm, I'm quite emboldened and encouraged by the evidence-based studies that are being conducted on this very serious matter. And I'm hope uh, I'm quite hopeful that you know we'll be able to come up with um, interventions that will seriously address um, the issues and the, the, the mental health that our, our women are, um, are going through. Um, so thank you very much. Bye.